welcome um, to our DePaul College of Education forum, and it is um, my job to introduce the panelists. So you have met Marie Donovan already, and I also want to give a special thanks to Marie because it was she who alerted me to the Inclusive Curriculum Act and has played just a, an important role um, in making sure that this program has happened today. She is an associate professor of teacher education, and she's also the director of our early childhood education program at DePaul. She serves as chair of the Faculty Advisory Council to the Illinois Board of Higher Education, where she advocates legislatively and otherwise for all pre-K all the way through college stakeholders, children, teachers, faculty, communities who deserve access to affordable, relevant, and meaningful 21st century education here in our um, state. Um, next is um, uh, Gracia Magdaleno, um, is an advocate, educator, organizer, and artist living in Chicago living at the intersection of queer and Latinx identity. Their work focuses on a broad scope of experiential issues regarding gender and sexuality, mental health, and trauma. They hold a Master's of art, Arts in Social Service Administration from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Arts in Women and Gender Studies from Arizona State University. She's currently serving as the policy and advocacy manager for the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance, which you'll hear more about um, later. And I also want to mention, when you came in, there's a table that Gracias helped set up, which has information from her, her organization and two other organizations that have been absolutely instrumental in this Equality Illinois and the Legacy Project. As the advocacy and policy manager, they is responsible for working with parents, students, teachers, school administrators, advocates, and community partners to promote safe and supportive educational environments for LGBTQ um, youth. Um, I skipped somebody. Dr. Rachel Harper in the red is an artist and researcher who teaches curriculum in elementary education and early childhood education here in the Department of Teacher Education at DePaul. Her research and teaching focuses on contemporary approaches to social studies education, curriculum studies, arts-based research, arts integration, and social practice. Um, Dr. Harper has presented on queer issues in education and national conferences and at many grassroots teacher workshops. She's also a co-author of a book, which you could see out on the table, and there's some flyers for how you can get it. It's a Rethinking Schools publication um, called Rethinking Sexism, Gender, and, um, and Sexuality. It's a book for teachers, and it's a lot of teacher narratives. Um, the next person in her CTU red um, is Alana Jacobs, is a middle school science, special education, and ESL teacher at Dr. Jorge Prieto Math and Science Academy in Chicago's Northwest Side. As a queer teacher in Chicago public schools, they are an active member of the Chicago Teachers Union and actively participates in the LGBTQ committee, the Career and Technical Education Committee, the Special Education Tax Force, and the Illinois LGBTQ History Task Force. Task Force. Alana uses her professional expertise to help students with disabilities set and achieve goals through the individual education plans, IEPs, that entitles them to special ed services. She also considers her work with special educators to follow up what she calls a robust plan using tools like ra rallies, advocacy, and even feather ruffling acts of civil disobedience to bring about positive um, change. And last, um, Adam Laredo is a 19 year, looks too young to be teaching for 19 years, national board certified teacher um, and is a third generation Chicago public school teacher. So your grandparents, parents, and um, now you. He's also a product of um, CPS and currently teaches sixth to eighth 
English language arts at Hamilton Elementary School, where he serves on the Curriculum Improvement Work Plan Committee. And those of you as CPS teachers know what that is. In addition to being Ham Hamilton's union delegate, he's a member of the Chicago Teachers Union Latinx Caucus, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators Corps, and is a mentor for CTU's um, Nurturing Teacher Leadership Program. And most recently, maybe you saw him on TV, yes? He was a member of the CTU negotiating team and organizer during the recent contract negotiations. So a warm DePaul welcome for our panelists. And Diane, would it be possible if, and if we could just go down the row and say our pronouns, would that be okay? Uh, sure. Okay, I use they, them pronouns, thank you. I use she and her. She and her. Uh, he, him, and his. And she and her. So again, welcome. As you see, and those of you who just came in, please come on, sit down. The fire marshal doesn't want you standing, so please come sit. Don't, you're not going to bother anybody coming in, so thanks. So why this form and why now? It's fitting that we're here this evening at a university named for St. Vincent de Paul at an event focused on this particular law, the Illinois Inclusive Curriculum Act. St. Vincent and his extensive network of colleagues, his confreres, dedicated their lives to addressing the exigent needs of those who lived at the margins. From their earliest days, the Vincentians concentrated their mission on understanding and finding remedies for those less fortunate, those misunderstood, and those who were persecuted for being different. Like the Vincentians, advocates who spent decades in realizing the passage of the Illinois Inclusive Curriculum Act were wholly focused on educating society about their need to know and to understand fellow citizens who often live at the margins of society simply because they identify differently. The act amends portions of the Illinois School Code that are related to curriculum content and instructional materials in specific ways. All publicly educated students in Illinois must learn about the contributions that gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people have made to our state's and our nation's history. Moreover, students must give evidence of their comprehensive knowledge of these contributions to meet eighth grade graduation requirements. Now the Inclusive Curriculum Act has deep roots. In 1979, legislators passed the Illinois Human Rights Act. This landmark legal statement affirmed the dignity of all people, ensuring that everyone can live without fear of discrimination because of where they came from, how they identify, and or with whom. The Illinois Human Rights Act continues to be amended to stipulate more specific identities of those protected by the law, as well as update particular protections required within situations found in schools, healthcare settings, and workplaces, among others. The details and language of the Inclusive Curriculum Act mirror those of the Human Rights Act, as they should. Now, as part of the Inclusive Curriculum Act's passage, Governor Pritzker issued an executive order on June 30th, 2019 that established the Affirming and Inclusive Schools Task Force. He ordered that that working group submit a report in January that informs stakeholders in three related ways. And by the way, you can access this report for free, just Google it. It's at il.gov, among other places. ISBE should be putting it up pretty soon, too. So the three ways that the governor said I need you to inform us. Number one, provide an overview of the legal rights of transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students in schools, as well as identify the rights that will guarantee all can be free of discrimination and harassment across their learning spaces. Secondly, identify and describe best practices in creating self, safe, welcoming, and affirming school environments for all LGBTQ plus students. And thirdly, recommend particular ways for schools to review their current practices and policies, as well as indicate what schools should include in their revisions to comply with the law. 
I encourage you to closely read the task force's report before you start your curriculum and policy deliberations at your school. You'll find the report's guidance statements helpful in creating checklists and procedures to affect the change necessary, not only within the curriculum, but also across the school environment. Now, no doubt some of you were surprised to read on the previous slide, excerpting the act, that the timeline for implementation of these curricular changes is July 2020, which is tomorrow on most school calendars, if you're like I am. Um, Last fall, while I was preparing a column that I wrote about the Inclusive Curriculum Act for the Illinois Reading Council Journal January issue, I met with a number of educators who privately expressed concerns about reworking their curricula in order to comply with the act. I also met a lot of educators who have never heard about the act. Please raise your hand, be honest, we just wanna get a sense. Who hasn't heard about the passage of this act, the Illinois Inclusive Curriculum Act? Yeah, that's not unusual. July, July 1st. <laughs> so this is why we're doing this tonight. So these, these educators I met with and, and listened to, they shared how even as adults, they never read or learned about contributions made by LBGTQ you know, people in history, never mind in Illinois, many of them said. And they worried about becoming sufficiently knowledgeable to meet their students' learning needs. Now, perhaps realizations like these are what sparked you to attend this evening. We're so glad you came. The fear of not knowing typically results in not teaching what needs to be taught. You're not alone in feeling this way if you do. Many others in this room and around the state are experiencing similar feelings. So it was with this knowledge that Diane and Rachel and I organized tonight's forum to begin the learning or for some of you to extend it in ways that will enable you to enact what you learn in relevant, purposeful curricula. Now, as you settle in to listen and learn this evening, I hope you'll consider this perspective of Dr. Catherine Williams Phillips, a recently deceased Columbia University professor of business. Her research centered on how employers address workplace diversity issues in an ever-changing world. She found that when she taught companies to examine diversity for what it is, their workplaces became more tolerant, more understanding of the other, tensions and conflicts diminished, workdays were more productive for all. Dr. Phillips' advice will serve us well this evening as we listen and learn. Her first dictum may seem counterintuitive at first, but try it on for size. Fight the impulse to seek out commonalities with those we encounter. Instead, embrace your differences by talking about contrasting life experiences. The environment you will create will be one where difference is normal. If you create that kind of environment in your schools, in your organizations, in your families, you will find that the value of diversity is there for you to capture. So at the start of any new project, St. Vincent and his confreres would, would ask themselves, so what must be done? Our panelists are here to share their thoughts based on their own experiences in fulfilling the spirit as well as the letter of the Inclusive Curriculum Act on what they know must be done. We've asked these experts to challenge the inevitable venerable assumptions about this mandate, and we've also asked them to teach us how to resist the status quo approach that arises when we're forced to deal with a new curricular mandate on such a short timeline. Educators are storytellers. I'm pleased to welcome these educators, these storytellers, to share their work in realizing the promise of the Inclusive Curriculum Act. And now I would like to turn things over to Chris. Thank you. Hello everyone, how are y'all doing? Good. <laughs> um, so I'd like to um, go a little bit off the cuff here and just imagine we're in a living room together having this conversation. Um, oh no, totally fine. Is that okay? Yeah, that's totally fine, I don't mind at all. <laughs> um, 
So hello, everyone. My name is Gracia Magdaleno. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the policy and advocacy manager for the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance, which is a statewide program of Public Health Institute of Metropolitan Chicago. And the mission of the Alliance, as we are known, is to promote safety, support, and healthy development for LGBTQ youth in Illinois schools and communities. And we do that through advocacy, education, youth organizing and research and I have the immense privilege of being able to work on policy and advocacy initiatives all throughout the state and one of those big projects that we're working on through the Alliance and PHIMC is the rollout of the inclusive curriculum law so we actually um, identify and name it as the inclusive curriculum law now that it's been signed um, by Governor Pritzker so but before I get into uh, what I'll be speaking to, which is setting a context for why this is important. I want to just speak to my own personal experience and why I think that the work that I do is important. So I, I myself am queer, non-binary. Um, I had no representation in school growing up of LGBTQ contributions in history and throughout all subject areas. And I wonder what it must be like to learn about figures that looked and represented my own experience. And I wonder where I would have been had that been a reality. So just as a reminder, we're all here because of young people in schools. We're all here trying to learn about the inclusive curriculum law because of young people. This is going to benefit them, and if we are going to change lives, have it be just one, then we know we'll be successful. So I just wanna keep that at the center of the conversations that we're going to be having tonight. Um, so I'd like to ground you all by giving some statistics on uh, school climate and culture and why it's important to take that into account as we're talking about the inclusive curriculum law. So, and by the way, I'm really, really grateful that DePaul invited us here. Um, and our, a big thank you to our partners and supporters before I get into this. Um, so in regards to school safety, um, I would like to bring in the GLSEN National School Climate Survey. Has anybody heard of it before? Would you raise your hand? Awesome, cool. So if you haven't read it, I highly recommend getting into it. It's a pretty dense report, but it's very accessible. You can find it on their website. And uh, through it, you're going to be able to uh, learn more about school climate and safety, what harassment and discrimination looks like for queer kids in schools. So they took all this information from schools across the country. So it is nationally based. It's not um, based in Illinois, but you can still glean a lot of information from it. So I'm just going to speak very quickly to um, school safety. So we have, within those that took the survey, 60% of LGBTQ students felt unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation, 44% because of their gender experience, Expression. Oh, did it go out? No. Oh, okay. Just changed. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> um, yeah, the echoing went out. Um, and then we have 35% because of their gender. So just take into account how many students that are walking through your halls or that you are related to, that you, you know, are your neighbors. Think about those folks walking through schools um, feeling you know, oppressed because of, you know, discrimination and harassment that's happening in their classrooms. And then in regards to anti-LGBTQ remarks at school, um, almost all survey respondents, so 98.5% of them, which is a really high number, um, who participated say that they heard the word gay being used in a negative context, um, e.g. like that's so gay, for example, um, and felt distressed because of it. And then 56.6% .6 of students heard homophobic remarks, not just from other peers, but from teachers as well, from educators, and 71% um, of them, oh, I'm sorry, from school staff, and then 71% of them heard it from a teacher. Um, and then, as we know, queer students experience disproportionate rates of harassment and assault at school, and this includes verbal harassment, physical harassment and assault, electronic harassment, because as we know, social media is a reality and this is something, this is a tool that students are using, and sexual harassment. Uh, most students who've gone through these things don't report it, and usually if they do, they're told to ignore it, or um, they are not presented with a solution, which is rather unfortunate. Um, but I also wanna speak to 
axes of oppression, and we have to think about our students who hold multiple intersecting identities, such as you know, people of color, those who are disabled, those who are struggling with mental illness, those who are immigrants or are undocumented. We have to start thinking about our queer students who hold those multiple identities and just how much more amplified this situation is for them because of the identities that they hold, right? So um, that's something to start thinking about in regards to how to best support your students is first think about what multiple intersecting identities are they holding, right? Um, we also have to start thinking about these statistics as a starting point. So the inclusive curriculum law is not meant to be the solve all for creating affirming learning environments for students. We have to see it as a jumping off point. I, I am so glad that the inclusive curriculum law has been passed and now we have you know, the challenge of starting to implement it and rolling it out in this first year and beyond, but we cannot just rely on the inclusive curriculum law to create a safer school climate. Uh, we want to start thinking about how do we create environments for the most marginalized that are going to be uplifting and empowering for them to be able to get them where they want to go, right? Um, so if you center the lived experiences of people like you or unlike you, it becomes difficult to justify bullying someone or whether that's on the student level or discriminating against a student, um, you know, if you are a teacher, right? So this is why however, the inclusive curriculum law is important. And I want to not um, under stress, I don't know if that's the word, I don't want to diminish how important this law is, but I'd also like to add some points about how to create an affirming school environment. So we offer, the Alliance offers professional development, which I'm really happy to um, talk to you more about afterwards. Um, but what we provide is creating affirming learning environments out of many other workshops that we provide. That is one of our most popular sessions. And what we talk about in creating affirming learning environments is that the main point, the main gist of that uh, workshop is that you have to take your personal belief and separate it from your professional responsibility. That is what is at the crux of this inclusive curriculum law is that we have to stress that you may hold personal beliefs that don't necessarily align with this law. However, when you walk through the doors of your school, you need to go ahead and uh, almost like put on a coat, right, that says, I am going to provide the best education I can for these students and my personal beliefs are not going to um, cross that line of my professional responsibility. So that's something we really touch on in our Creating Affirming Learning Environments workshop. And it starts a lot of conversations, hard conversations, right? Because there are a lot of parents who don't necessarily feel like they want their children to be learning about this, but understand that they're professional responsibility has to come first, or that educators' professional responsibility has to come first. Um, we've also received a lot of questions regarding um, how to create affirming learning environments outside of the inclusive curriculum law, and there's a couple that I can name. So the first, as you noticed, is I um, asked for pronouns. That is an easy way to kind of level set and make sure that everyone in the room uh, has an equitable experience, and it's super easy. Even folks who don't identify as transgender or gender nonconforming can start the conversation by saying, hello, my name is, and I use these pronouns, right? That's a really easy way to start creating an affirming learning environment. The second is stressing that, you know, there needs to be a gender neutral bathroom in, or an all gender bathroom on your school campus. By law, you have to have at least one, um, but sometimes they're not accessible. Sometimes they're, you know, hidden. Um, there are a lot of different reasons why uh, that's still a challenge and we need to go ahead and address those, but that's one way to do that. And then also thinking about name changes and um, pronoun usage in school systems, such as um, uh, school records, right? Uh, we need to start thinking about how can we jump the obstacles that these systems present to go ahead and let folks use an affirmed name, right? So an affirmed name is one that you were not given at birth, but that you align with now. So there are many different ways to create this culture, right? And that's why it's important uh, to stress that yes, the inclusive curriculum law is important, and then there are other um, strategies that you can take to really make this a holistic um, 
a holistic process. And then the last thing I'll go ahead and talk about is um, we've received questions about pushback and concerns from parents, administrators, and community members about how this is going to impact public schools at large. And I think it really depends on the question that folks are asking. So um, if folks are asking, how do I do this? How do I comply with the law? What does fidelity and uh, confidence in complying with the law look like? Uh, we would like to say that we are in the process of uh, so to answer that question, we are the Alliance and the Legacy Project and Equality Illinois are, are a group that is working together along with the Illinois State Board of Education to work on this process of implementation and the rollout. So through that, we're developing a guidance document or a how-to that is going to help teachers and administrators, educators and administrators, implement this in their classroom. So that's one strategy that we're working on. Um, and in terms of complying with the law, we know that a lot of times reporting mechanisms often result, for example, in sex ed, the only way that they have reporting mechanisms is by complaint. Um, and we wanna go outside of that, right? We want to step back from that and create systems where we can find out who is actually implementing this in classrooms and how and to what degree, to what extent. Um, so we are in the process of developing those systems as well. Um, and we'd also like to talk a little bit to parents, administrators, and community, all, all of the folks that are involved in this um, rollout, um, if there are complaints about pushback, we again bring back or what to do with pushback, we refer a lot again to what we use in creating affirming learning environments about personal belief and professional responsibility. We like to talk to that um, quite a bit. And then this is where professional development comes in handy. Um, the Alliance, but other organizations as well that work with LGBTQ youth, professional development is one strategy that all schools, all districts should be investing in as a way to comply with the law at a minimum. Schools should be tapping into organizations that provide this professional development as a way to ensure that educators are familiar with, become comfortable with the, um, the concept of LGBT history in classrooms and beyond, right? And creating affirming learning environments for all students. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what I have to say about what implementation looks like in setting a context. Um, again, I'd really like to highlight the group, the coalition that I'm in with Equality Illinois and the Legacy Project and the Alliance. We are um, essentially, we are the team working with ISB to implement this and um, we're working with a bunch of other partners as well through um, an advisory council and a, a subcommittee. We have folks who are interested in this work and we have ways for you to plug in. So we're really excited about this work that's happening. I'm just honored to be here today, and I really want to thank you all for letting me speak to a bit of this. So thank you. Hello. Just going to move this guy. So, curriculum. Let's talk about curriculum. Let me. So, curriculum is everything that we teach, whether or not it's learned. But curriculum is also everything that's learned, whether or not we ever meant to teach it. While the law we're here to talk about today is very simple, the implications for our classroom run very deep and stretch out in many directions. But first, the simple part. The inclusive curriculum law itself says that if you teach history in Illinois, you can't choose to leave out some people just based on the color of their skin or their gender or their sexuality or any aspect of identity that's protected by the Human Rights Act. If you teach history in Illinois, it has to include all of the people who have made the most important contributions to who we are today. The law says that if the way you're teaching history doesn't already include LGBTQ history, now is the time to make a couple updates. 
So that's a simple idea, teach a complete history. The scope is therefore really small too. If you think about elementary curriculum, English, science, social studies, art, physical education, if you look into the specific social science domains and then look down just into history, that small portion of the curriculum needs to be checked over to make sure that it isn't leaving out LGBTQ history. And that doesn't mean that queer issues shouldn't show up. You know, I need to be more close, okay. All right. So that doesn't mean that LGBTQ or that queer issues shouldn't show up throughout the entire curriculum, of course, that they should, in all the ways that we're hearing about today, because everyone has a gender and everyone has a sexuality, and because history should be integrated throughout the curriculum. But from a technical standpoint, the curricular task is very small. Now, because most of us were taught an incomplete version of history when we were children, many of us may not feel like we know enough about queer history to automatically know where it fits into alignment with the history standards that we use. And that's okay, because for this simple idea and very small scope, there is a natural process that we already use. A constant about curriculum is that whenever we have new subject matter or a new um, emphasis from the district, or when we just come to naturally see that our curriculum needs to be refreshed, we do two things. We look for resources, like the resources we're hearing about today, and we use them to learn more about the content. And then we think about our students and the context and anything else that we need to deliberate on. And when we bring these things together, we update the curriculum. That's what we do for a living. We're constantly making small adjustments to keep our curriculum alive, relevant, beautiful, effective, and inclusive. So while the idea is simple, and the task is small, and the process is natural, it's important to take a moment to notice how deep the implications are for students and for the society. If we think that education has two primary purposes, one, to promote the growth of the individual, and two, to provide for a more just and democratic society, the event of this law helps us look all the way down into the root of what curriculum really is and what it really has the capacity to transform. How is knowledge itself the key tool here? Okay, so. How many of you remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Oh, that's good. So you remember him well. Well, so he was an educator on TV who taught uh, from 1968 to 2001. And his curriculum was a very gentle and affirming exploration of civic kindness and natural inquiry. But something that Mr. Rogers did that was really radical was that he was creating a safe space for learning through a television set by evoking a constant atmosphere of unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. He said, I like you just the way you are. And for a lot of children sitting in front of those TV sets, that may have been the only person in their lives saying, I like you just the way that you are. He would sing, it's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not your beautiful wheelchair. It's the way down deep inside you. It's not the things that hide you. Yeah, he was great. And when you feel that safe, you can begin to learn. Not just in school, but in every part of life, safety is the first hurdle to growing and becoming. For LGBTQ kids in our schools, this kind of message of unconditional acceptance is sometimes completely absent, and that's one of the main reasons why we're here. It's sometimes emerging, and sometimes it's very well developed. But what's so important for us to stop and understand is that no matter how safe and inclusive a school space is designed to be, queer students still struggle to feel accepted. There's always an underlying awareness of queer identity being a less accepted identity, and that's just because of the broader social world in which we live. Even the youngest children know that homophobia exists, and they also know that it's dangerous. From an anti-bias perspective, we need to see 
No, no, we already do see the need for education to create conditions for a safer and more equ equitable society. We believe the positive change, wait, hold on, let me see. Yes, we believe the positive change comes from getting to the root of structures that create danger and oppression. We teach directly into the root of problems when our social curriculum illuminates a diversity of backgrounds and ideas, emphasizing the realities of people of color, the history of struggles of liberation, the dynamics of power in civic life and in economics, and all the ways that all struggles for justice are completely interconnected. When we teach deep into the systems to reveal how they work, not just the surface conditions that they create, we aim to change the roots and see something more equitable grow. For example, we know that it's urgent to address systems of homophobia, no, no, symptoms of homophobia like bullying. Bullying in schools is a surface condition of a deeper system. The inclusive curriculum law points towards addressing the root cause of bullying, which is an incomplete historical curriculum. In a world where any group of people are so marginalized that they're completely erased from apparent existence, it becomes very easy to act as if they should not exist. And thus we have bullying. You shouldn't exist, I'm gonna treat you that way. And it becomes very easy for a child to feel as if she shouldn't exist. And therefore we see so many queer child suicides. So back to Mr. Rogers. I like you just the way you are. I came out for the first time when I was 15 years old. Even though this was 25 years ago and in Florida. I know, I know. I actually, thank you for that, but there's good news. I actually felt as confident as a kid might possibly feel because I happened to be attending a public school that was already at the place where this law is asking us to be, surprisingly. We had a gay-straight alliance. Gay teachers were nonchalantly out of the closet. In history class, I learned about civil rights movements from around the United States and the world um, that included the struggles of women and queer people. And I took art classes where I learned about artists. I learned how someone like Keith Haring used painting to raise consciousness about the AIDS crisis because it affected him personally as a gay man in the 80s. My teacher never really said, look how much this gay artist matters. He just said, look at this practice and look at that practice and look at this practice and look at your practice. But the fact that artists I learned about were of all kinds of races and colors and genders and sexuality, I learned the people of all identities held important methods for the skills that I really wanted to develop. It didn't seem to matter much at the time whether or not they were gay but the fact that gay people mattered at all mattered a lot. So when I came out, as scary as it was to wrestle with the fear of rejection that every queer person faces, I was in a school environment where I was very well accepted. Those who were closest to me sounded like Mr. Rogers. I'll always like you just the way you are. Queer people in this audience right now who also came out as kids may not have had such a best case scenario. But if you heard, I accept you, you probably also heard a second part to the message. We often used to hear, I accept you for who you are, but I'm also really sad that your life will be hard. I see a lot of people nodding and a lot of people frowning. The Fed. Young people still hear this today when well-meaning adults say to queer kids, you're great and I wanna help you with the difficult stuff that you're gonna face. This sentiment might be an empathetic recognition of actual reality, since queer oppression is real and everywhere. But this statement expresses a real hopelessness that the very bad treatment is both inevitable and unchangeable. As teachers, many of us are at the stage of our relationship with queer children that it may be very easy to tell them that we love them and accept them. If you think about your own classroom and imagine a child coming up to you and saying, I have something to tell you, 
I'm transgender. Most, if not all of us in this room would feel really glad that this child trusts us and feels safe with us. And we wouldn't hesitate to make that child feel affirmed and loved and accepted, use their real name, use their real pronouns. But the question that this law brings up is, what can the curriculum do to refute the idea that a continuing homophobic society is inevitable and unchangeable? Get into the root, that's how. How you teach is not enough. Kind and caring aren't enough. What we leave out teaches as much as what we put in and a curriculum of silence is never neutral. How can we say to an individual child, I accept you completely, but I also accept homophobia completely? How can we not take the simple and small action of putting into knowledge roots that could grow a society where life doesn't have to be harder for queer people? You might think that such a simple idea that history includes everyone and such a small task as making sure to include queer history in what you already teach can't possibly change the world. And if you think that, I mean, you're partly right. It took the queer civil rights movement a very long time to raise enough consciousness to change laws like the one we're talking about today. And an equitable society can't be made by curriculum alone. But the curriculum alone is what we control. Knowledge is our power in the fight for everything that we hope to see. Believe in it. Hold open a space that's more than just safe. Make it brave. Draw up a curriculum that's more than just complete. Make it liberatory. And if you're not sure how, remember that you're not the only one. We're all in this work together. All of us are in this work together. No matter how much experience you have or don't have with queer issues in general, sorting out how to bring them into the classroom is a unique process because it is deep. Gender, sexuality, families, identities are so essential to who we are as people that these issues touch us all in emotional ways. So keep it simple. Don't change everything. Trust your own knowledge of what students need and use one resource to change one thing and see how it feels. Were they right that my life will be hard? Sure, life's hard, right? For everyone. But being queer makes my life beautiful because my life, like everyone's life in this room, is defined by what I love the most. I love curriculum. I'm a nerd. I love my students. I love justice, I love education, I love my chosen family. What we love is our core source of meaning. Let this law spur you to be the kind of teacher who is driven enough by your core source of meaning to see every child and think, I like you just the way you are, and I'm gonna teach into the root because society needs my help and because your life is already so beautiful. Thank you. I'm pleased to be able to introduce again Alana Jacobs. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ilana Jacobs, and I approach this as um, possibly thinking about a teacher who might not be as familiar with teaching social studies, or also a teacher who might be uncomfortable with possibly teaching LGBTQ um, issues, but knowing that the youth are probably more easygoing with this. Um, currently, where I teach at Prieto in and this is my first year at the school, in every single classroom, they have this, um, they have this sticker. So. And I've never, I've been 
I've mostly taught in South and West Side schools in high needs, high poverty areas teaching science, and I've never seen stickers in every single classroom. So for me, this was something really amazing being in a neighborhood school and not a selective enrollment, predominantly Latinx school. So just just seeing that was like absolutely incredible. Just, I've, just the visibility makes a difference. Okay. So um, most of the schools that I have worked at do not teach social studies. And so two years ago, I was told as a science teacher, you're gonna teach sixth, seventh, eighth grade science and one section of social studies. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I'm, again, I'm thinking, how are we going to do it? And we had great fun with doing Scholastic News, and I just did whatever sort of I found, and I did a more um, inquiry brace, you know, the way I sort of teach science. And then last year I went to a social studies conference, and I got a grant through Chicago Public Schools to attend it. And I'm like, oh, that's how you're, they want you to teach social studies inquiry based like a science teacher and use like um, uh, primary sources. I'm like, okay, I, I got this with discussions and everything and make like, make social studies come alive the way I make science come alive. So that's how, that's how I taught it. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the K-2 teacher. So I thought, okay, how would I approach this first? Um, I would look at the social studies standards that I was expected to teach and think the English language arts, like, okay, um, cause I know there's like all these different requirements, so how could we sort of fit it in? So focus on, um, so I found K2 and uh, summarizing changes that have occurred in local community over time, individuals and groups with significant historical change, and explaining how different kinds of historical sources, documents, artistic works, oral counts can be studied in the past. Um, and last week also, I talked with the Chicago Public Schools social studies curriculum people, and they're doing some really innovative stuff, and some of the professional development is phenomenal. And I was just asking, so how are you guys recommending rolling out LGBT initiatives? And they were also talking about, well, we're, we also need to make sure we hit um, the initiatives with the reparations. So it's a more like uh, an overall, approach with different lenses. So it could be a lens of LGBT. So what I, what I thought about is, and also um, looking at some of the, the curriculum that is available. Um, and so I dug deep in, um, I thought, let's focus on if I was teaching civil rights, okay? And with that, I could focus on one, uh, I could, um, talk about Bayard Rustin, an openly um, uh, gay um, civil rights act activist. So I took it from the Legacy Project. I looked what they had at teaching tolerance. I looked at um, facing history, facing ourselves, and the Stonewall Book Awards. So I would start with a, a picture of Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King, meet the unknown hero of civil rights movement. So just as a setting the stage for, uh, for students and the conversation. Also wanted to incorporate some, some murals, right? So this is a Bayard Rustin saying, um, we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers our power is our ability to make things unworkable. And by the way, in my science classroom, I have pictures of different scientists and also below, um, I was inspired by the social studies teachers and the language arts teachers at my school. So um, I found like some LGBT activists. So the way I incorporate, so I have a picture of Bayard Rustin, um, other, uh, other activists, and they, I said that they are just people who are making the 
the community a better place. And so I put it specifically in my class as students are walking out the door so they could read about some of these students, some of these people, and ask some questions and sort of piquing the curiosity. I thought you could approach it, well, Bayard Rustin has an elementary school, right? And so you could play the, the video about um, Bayard Rustin Elementary School. And we have here just who is Bayard Rustin. So I also thought um, from an older, maybe middle school student's perspective, some of the essential questions. How do you think Rustin's discrimination as an African American was like discrimination as a gay man? How do you think is different? So I think maybe with the K-2 curriculum, you could say like, how, how, was, how was life hard as an African American person or, and uh, as a gay man? Um, I thought you could go show a clip about Brother Outsider, um, reflect on why Bayard Rustin may not be as well known as other civil rights leaders, what impact did he, his repeated separation from his work have on civil rights movement. So you could go more in depth. Um, then there's books. So focusing on K2, I found a picture book that um, We Are the One by Larry Brimner. And I was thinking um, years back, I was a kindergarten assistant teacher. And so going back to those amazing picture books, also um, I found different um, chapter books, Bayard Rustin, The Scenes Behind the Civil Rights Movement, I must resist Bayard Rustin's life and letters. So asking, um, including your, adding more books to your school library, or maybe you're lucky enough to have a school librarian and adding more to, to that collection or going to your local library. Um, so, and then we have some about archives. So, the story about Bayard Russin. So all different ways to tell his story. Then I have a picture of Bayard Rustin and his partner. And I figured like a lot of conversation that students might have and questions and curiosities and um, observations. So again, I was thinking maybe how can we teach uh, some more how can we have conversation with K2 students? So I thought about picture books. And I know there's this amazing press called Flamingo Rampant Press. It's a queer-owned press. I actually went to college with um, Bear Bregman. And I just love this, this small press. And they say, we, we make books kids love. Kids love them right back. Bedtime stories for beautiful dreams and books that make kids of all kinds with pride. That's, that's kids just like me. So that's one way that you could start additional conversation. So here are some pictures of the books that Bear, Begman, Bear, Bear Bregman wrote. Is that a for a boy or a girl. So as a way to read the book and sort of start a conversation and have some, um, some things that, conversation that might be easy for youth but might be a little bit more difficult for the adults, right? Um, also, power poems for small humans, just sort of st starting the day, ending the day. Um, so I met Todd Parr, the family book. So I was trying to think about like goofy books, serious books, a whole range of things. So Harvey Firestone, the sissy duckling. So even talking about what the word sissy means and, um, and how, how this duckling has approached life. 
So, so those are some starts, and there are some really amazing books from the Stonewall Award collection. Um, and then I thought some other things that could approach this was you read the book and then having a conversation at circle time about, so with teaching tolerance, um, a handout, disagreeing with gray statements, saying you're right and this is how I feel. So sentence starters that I use, um, practice with students for science class, but just practice to students to be active listeners, to be kinder. I think that's okay and it's true for you and what's true for me is something else. So that's a really good point and I feel differently. So um, I worked a lot with my middle school youth about just training them how to respectfully disagree. And if some of these conversations were started and emphasized in pre-K, actually I know they're started in pre-K, but if they continued all the way around, by the time that they're sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, these conversations hopefully would be a little bit easier. So you guys, you're laying the groundwork. And then if, um, again, I, I pulled out from teaching tolerance, because I know there's a strong um, early elementary history with the teaching tolerance. And so there was a lesson plan for using the word gay. So it seems like a lot of different approaches or controversies, controversies that, that come up, here are some ways that you could deal with it. Um, you could approach it in your classroom. Um, and that, again, I think also that the youth might be more understanding and accepting. It might be more hesitation coming from, from the adults. Thank you very much. So good evening. Um, Thank you for giving that chance to stand up from those chairs. It takes me back to my own undergrad experience and living in a dorm. Um, and if you know those chairs are very dorm recommended. Um, so my own story, my own story is um, not the shiny one that it turns out into. Um, I was a teacher in a closet, um, and yes, I've been teaching for 19 years, and I'm a third generation educator, so I knew what I was getting into. Um, and much to the chagrin of my family when I announced to them that I wanted to go into the family business without money, um, <laughs> education, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, they were, of course, concerned and worried um, for a number of reasons. But I think one that went unspoken was, what will people think? And how will you approach life? Um, so immediately going to um, in the wonderful field of education, I did um, embrace a philosophy of don't ask, don't tell, right? It's horrible, absolutely horrible. It was not just a service to my own being, but a service to my students. Because how could I be an effective educator without accessing the full array of who I am? It's like asking a teacher to tie one hand behind their back and to teach an effective lesson. You can do it, but it won't be best practice, right? For those of us who know that term. Um, so, going back, in my undergrad experience, um, when I was, you know, you know, fledgling, just and bright-eyed, um, I came across a book. It was called Reflections of a Rock Lobster by Aaron Frick. Um, for those of you who also were lucky enough to grow up in the 80s, um, you might recall a song called Rock Lobster. And I would encourage you to Google it later if you are not familiar with this. <laughs> it is a semi-autobiographical novel about a student who is out in high school and goes to prom um, and, of course, dances at his prom with um, his dates to the song Rock Lobster, which is great. Um, and I thought to myself, how amazing and wonderful would it have been if I were a student that were exposed to these types of texts? If I had lived um, in an educational community where I saw myself in my classroom and in my teachers, 
and I think we've heard a lot about this already in, in stories, in that our students are in front of us. Um, and when we take into consideration the high suicide rates of our students who identify as LGBTQIA+, when we take into consideration the number of homeless youth who are tossed out, it is moral imperative for us as educators. It's not a choice. It's a moral imperative to come out of the closet. And so it was a slow process, and it happened with the support and love of a lot of coworkers, um, and certainly of my own partner. Um, but today, um, from the first day, I try to encourage and foster an environment which is inclusive and building a community for my students which is based in safety and equity. And for those of you who are National Board Certified Teachers or who are thinking about going down that path, that is literally a question they ask you. How do you create a safe and equitable environment? And it's actually one of the toughest questions for many people to answer, is because you have to really stop and think. Do I do that? Am I conscious about it? Do I do it deliberately or do I just simply trip over it, right? So from the first day, I ensure that I have my safe school zone stickers up in my windows, in addition to my CTU sticker. <laughs> I make sure that I have my pride flag along with my American flag, right? Um, I ensure that I have a picture of my partner and I up. And whenever I come back from a trip and I show students pictures of my vacations, um, here I am in Japan, inevitably they always ask the question, who's that guy with you? And without stopping and trying not to pause too much, I say, that's my partner. Because I think as one of our previous speakers pointed out, it's not the idea of highlighting it so much as it is, it's normal. And that's the way you approach it, right? So here I am in my 19th year of teaching, looking at year 20. Um, and it is the idea that what is normal is creating safe inequity, right, within our classrooms. So I know that not all of us may teach in a school or an educational community where we feel like we can do this. So I would say the first step is really identifying your allies. Who are those individuals that you can go to, who you can bounce ideas off of? Those might be the first individuals that you come out to. Those are people that you definitely want to share your stories with. It's essential as an educator, we all know this, to have somebody that you banter with in the hallways once the bell has rung. The same thing is true for those of us who are LGBTQIA, for any teacher, find your allies, right? Contractually, too, in Chicago, you are protected. I can only speak for Chicago right now, okay. Um, <laughs> But you are protected, so you should feel safe if you choose to teach in Chicago, if you're currently teaching in Chicago, to come out. Nothing can happen to you because of that. Um, there is, of course, we've heard about it, the LGBTQ caucus at CTU. The union is very LGBT friendly, very much so. But going along with the whole fostering and welcoming environment, um, I would highly encourage you, if you've not looked at the website for the Illinois Safe School Alliance, to definitely do that. They actually also offer professional development, which you can invite into your schools. So if you're lucky enough to be on your PPLC or your ILT or your CIWP <laughs> or any number of the acronym committees that they grace us with, if you drive the curriculum discussion, I would encourage you to contact them and invite them in to do a professional development. Even for the individuals who identify as allies, it may be very eye-opening to have very frank conversations again about pronoun usage, right? Because honestly, especially for our generation, we're still having that conversation, and we should. Um, they can also many times provide you with resources such as posters, um, pins. I think often, my classroom is the first one in a school where students come in and they see the word lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, along with the word safe on a poster. And I can't tell you how many times my sixth graders, because I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth, come in and hyper-focus on that poster, but in a good way. Um, October is also LGBTQIA History Month. It's identified as that because October 11th, for those of us who aren't aware, is a National Day of Silence. It also coincides with the 1987 Second March in Washington for Gay Rights. Um, that's why it's selected. 
Um, but often, many schools and universities, unfortunately, push it to April because, as we know, you're still trying to get your act together in September and October, right? So wherever you do it at, be conscious and do it. Because often, especially as teachers, you know, we, that first couple of months, and especially your first year, you're investing a lot of money in things. Um, and for new teachers, I highly recommend laminate everything, <laughs> right? You always look for those ready-made bulletin board sets. My bulletin board set for Black History Month, my bulletin board set for Hispanic Heritage Month, my bulletin board set for Women's History Month. There is no bulletin board set yet for LGBT History Month. So it's up to us as educators to create and design those materials right now. Do it. I would highly encourage you, when you're looking for posters of artists, of writers, I'm an English teacher, make a conscious effort again to deliberately find and identify individuals who you can put in your classroom that represent the whole spectrum of our students' identity. Um, cultural context is, of course, very important when it comes to English. For those of us who are English teachers, you know, often falls to us to teach, again, social science to cover what's not covered, um, unfortunately, for better or for worse, in many other curriculums. Um, so I would highly encourage us to go beyond just, you know, the chestnuts. Um, we often start off with Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, they're LGBT, right? But as a student, when I heard this, I often thought to myself, great, so they were all European and they're all dead. <laughs> right. Or they're named after a turtle. <laughs> but I would also encourage us not to forget the many warriors who fought and came before us. Harvey Milk, thinking about many of the people who have given their lives. Keith Haring, the artist who have created beauty. Harper Lee the authors who have designed American literature and continue to do so. Um, individuals such as Representative Barbara Jordan. There were other individuals before Pete. <laughs> James Baldwin, Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard would be as old as I am right now. And I think about that a lot because that was my senior year of college and I can still remember the day. So I would encourage us not to forget those individuals. I would even dare say too, um, many of our students have never heard of Marsha P. Johnson. Anyone? Yes. The self-identified drag queen who threw the first brick slash rock at the Stonewall riots, right? Um, I would encourage us in our classrooms too to think about how you design your journal prompts. Make these individuals, you know, take their quotes, make them come alive. How do you feel about this individual's quote? What challenge do you encounter in lives, in your life rather, um, that you connect with this, right? How can we make this not just a month, but incorporate it every single day into our curriculum? Um, as an English teacher, of course, um, classroom library is a must, especially being in a city where we are blessed with having 50 public schools with a library out of 500. Yes, not that I am biased at all. <laughs> but if you do, and if you are lucky enough to have a library, I would encourage you to start seeking out many of those texts. Um, some wonderful texts are, again, of course, a collection of short stories called I Am, Am I Blue, which is edited by Bauer. Um, it's a collection of really nice short stories, specifically for middle school, but also great for high school too. Um, you take little snippets, it's wonderful. The cover has amazing artwork on it. Um, Tommy Stands Alone by Gloria Val Valasquez is another of her amazing text also. You probably want to include into a classroom library. Um, Rainbow Boys by Alex Sanchez. Reflections of Rock Lobster, naturally, too. Um, but I would also say, too, oh, I did bring MI Blue. But I think part of the challenge for teachers is that we often can't teach LGBT history or incorporate it or talk about the individuals who came before us because often we're ignorant of it. And that's not, no fault of our own, but as educators, you know that often we have to educate ourselves first. 
And so I would say a great text for that is The Gay and Lesbian History for Kids. You could tell I'm a teacher because of the way I hold this book. <laughs> What's fantastic about this text, too, is that it comes with 21 activities. Yes, yes. If you can get it, get it, right? Um, I would encourage you, especially being here at DePaul, there are many amazing um, opportunities um, that are not too far. For those of you um, who are going to education, I would encourage you right now to start building your classroom library. Also, save all your books. Don't get rid of any of them, even the ones from when you were a kid. I still have some of my, many of my children's books, and I put them into my classroom library. But there is a bookstore not too far from here called Underbridge Bookstores. Support your independent bookstores. They have a fantastic LGBT section. I would also encourage you to go to Open Books. They have several locations, or a couple locations at least, across the city. One in Pilsen. There's also one in the West Loop. They have a fantastic LGBT section as well. I would encourage you to raid them when they have their sales. Um, there are also many fantastic field trip opportunities in Chicago as well, too. The Legacy Walk, of course, right? It's free in Chicago. Free is a good field trip. Take them down. It's about three square blocks, three to five square blocks. Um, and it's wonderful because I can't think of how many square blocks, although I've walked down that street many times. Thank you, eight. <laughs> this is why I don't teach math. <laughs> but it's a fantastic opportunity for kids to see history in front of themselves. And it's free again. This is wonderful. Also, the Gerber Hart Library and Archives, which now offers field trip opportunities. So that's another fantastic way to take your kids somewhere local. We always think of like national, national, but there's things here in, in Chicago as well. There's also two great websites I would encourage you to visit as well. Um, abebooks.com, like Abe, like Abraham, abebooks.com. They have 30 essential books for young adults, for queer young adults. Bookriot.com, book riot being one word, offers a list of 20 queer youth adult books. You can find these lists a lot of places, but these are two good places to begin your journey and to start off. Um, I would also, as a member of the Chicago Gay Men's Chorus, encourage you to seek out the Chicago Man Gay Men's Chorus um, because we offer an educational outreach program. Mm -hmm. We do sing at schools, we perform at schools. Um, they came to my own school, um, which is fantastic, singing in front of your own students. Um, and visit other schools. We offer a Q&A opportunity as well, too, and share our own stories in that process. So if you're looking to bring in some art, give us a call. It's easy to find us on the web. Um, I'm going to wrap up just with a challenge as teachers. Uh, you know, often, especially when we're, you know, when you're at a party or you're at some sort of like gathering, people will ask, what do you do for a living, right? And you're like, yeah, I, well, I'm a teacher, you know. And you laugh because you know we do that very often, <laughs> right? I'm a teacher. But I would encourage you to start taking that on with more pride. Pride. Because that's what it comes down to, right? Because when you think about it, it's us. We're the first line of defense in creating this safe and equitable environment. We are the ones who are beginning this battle that needs to be fought from a place of love. So in the process of teaching human beings how to read and being the nurses to kids who scrape their knees on the playground, being the occasional social worker for schools that do not have one and deserve one, being the school therapist for schools that should have a school psychologist, being the parent to many kids who do not have a parent or being the loving parent, I would encourage you not to say, I'm a teacher, but to say, I am a teacher. Thank you. So I just want um, another giant round of applause for our great panel.